Thank you, Doug. Please keep the Bibles open in Psalm 69, and there's an outline you've got in your hands. Save me, O God. Well, so begins Psalm 69. Here is the heartfelt cry of one in desperate need. Verse 1 continues, for the waters have come up to my neck. The experience is like that of drowning. Just this summer, my boys and I went swimming in the sea. It was relatively calm, not too far out, but still you feel the sea's strength and your own weakness. Well, I wonder, have you ever been in serious difficulty in open water? Even for a few moments, you weren't sure whether your next breath might be your last powerless. Verse 2, sinking, about to go under, nowhere to put your feet, the water overwhelming, sheer terror. And here in his deep distress, the psalmist cries out to God, but verse 3, his throat is parched, wearied by the shouting when there's no response, eyes grow dim, tired for looking for help which doesn't come. And it hurts all the more because, verse 3, he is waiting for his God. Where is God in all this? In suffering, the one who believes in God wrestles with even more urgent questions than the unbeliever. Doesn't God hear me? Why doesn't he respond? Do something. Answer. Well, Psalm 69 has much to say to all of us. As we heard, it's a longish psalm. We can't cover it all this afternoon. We'll see the headlines. For us then to go away and ponder and pray through. And as we heard the psalm being read, maybe some verses sounded familiar, which uh, isn't surprising. Psalm 69 is one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. You'll see some of the references there on the sheet, which I'll refer to as we go through. So what can we learn then from this psalm? Well, we'll focus on three main areas. First of all, Psalm 69 shows us what the world is like. It shows us what the world is like. So this was written by King David about a thousand years before Christ. He was obviously experiencing severe trials. But it's not about suffering in general. Let's uh, read on now to verse 4. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What did I not steal? Must I now restore? So what's causing David's distress? Well, quite simply, other people. Other people are after him, and there's no good reason for it. They will destroy him, given the chance. Truth is not to be paid any attention to at all. David is innocent, but he's the one being forced to make amends. I wonder, do we lie awake at night? Because of what other people are doing to us. Or maybe what they might do to us. Maybe we don't understand. Why are they treating me like this? Maybe we know we haven't done what we're being accused of. We don't deserve this. So why am I being victimised and targeted? Why do people lie about me and treat me like this? Well, we read on. It turns out David does know the root of all this. It's there in verse 7. He says, for it is for your sake that I have borne reproach, that dishonour has covered my face. So all of this flows one way or the other because David is serving God. So the suffering in view here is not simply what others will do to us in general, but in particular because we're Christians. What hurts so much about this suffering? Well, we saw there in verse 7. Bearing reproach, dishonour. We care so very much what other people think of us. It affects us by everything, much as we would deny it, how we look, how we wear, uh, what we wear, what we say, what we do. Just about everything is controlled by the view of others. Maybe there are some in particular whose opinion is especially important. Even that look they give us, we hate it. That alone is almost too much to bear, but they'll talk too. Look down to verse 12. 
I am the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. We can't stand it when they make fun of us at our expense. Now we know, don't we, this is what it's like as Christians. It's why we stay quiet so often. And then in our daily lives we compromise all the time. We go along with the crowd, even when a large part of us simply doesn't want to. So important, the approval of others that we crave. Even given the chance, we would prefer physical suffering over this dishonour. Dishonour is to be avoided at all costs. John Calvin puts it like this. Many are to be found resolutely prepared to encounter death, who are by no means prepared to exhibit equal fortitude in the endurance of shame. Just think of Jesus' disciple, Peter, do you remember? Willing to lay down his life if it was going to be a sword fight. Confessing to a servant girl that he knew the arrested Christ, too much. And this shame and dishonour has practical consequences. Verse 20, if you flip over, speaks of a broken heart, speaks of desperate loneliness. And then when it couldn't get any worse, surely, verse 21 they gave me poison for food. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. That is, in place of life-giving food, poison. For a parched throat, sour wine, to make it all the worse. This is inhumane cruelty, kicking a man when he's well and truly down. And this is the experience of David. Well, I wonder, as Christians, what do we expect from the world. How do we think the world will treat us? What will be our experience? In John's Gospel, Jesus speaks to his disciples to prepare them for what is to come. And to set their expectation levels, he quotes Psalm 69. He says, the world will hate you. Now, if you like me, we harbour hopes, don't we? I'll be the exception somehow. I'll avoid this treatment. But Psalm 69 is here to set us straight. There will be those invitations that you hope for that will never come. Relationships will be strained. There'll be snide remarks. Incredulity that you could hold to such intolerant views. Passed over for promotion the untrue accusation about you, all the way through to beheadings by ISIS for those who confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is the world in which we live. With that, Psalm 69 then goes on to show us, second, why Jesus had to die. Why did Jesus have to die? Last week, a member of this congregation uh, invited some of his work colleagues over for dinner, got me to come and give a short introduction about Jesus, and then there'd be discussion and questions. So I explained Jesus was the Son of God in the flesh. That means we can know who God is and what he is like. And then we opened it for comments. Now, on those occasions, you never quite know where the conversation is going to go. But the issue raised this time was... Well, it didn't look like it. They explained what they meant. Jesus was rejected, suffered. He died alone in agony. How does that make sense if this was God himself on earth? Even his disciples didn't get it. This doesn't make any sense. Well, that's a good question. We're thinking, as Jesus was hanging on the cross, about to die, what was he thinking about? Well, in John 19, we read this. Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. The jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. At the moment of his death, Jesus had Psalm 69 in mind. More than that, he deliberately draws attention to it. 
as does the gospel writer John in recording it for us. As if to say, if you want to understand Jesus, why, as the Son of God, he had to endure all this, why he had to die, well, look to Psalm 69 for an explanation. So that's what we'll do. Psalm 69 was written by David of his personal experience, but through it, God speaks to us all the more about Christ. Tells us, first of all, of Christ's zeal for God. Look down to verse 9. For zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. I wonder if you were asked to describe Jesus, what he was like, what would you say? Strong, loving, humble, wise, all of those things and more he is wonderfully. I wonder, would that have sprung to mind, the word we find here, zeal? Jesus was zealous. I wonder, do you know anyone who is driven, ambitious, determined to succeed, whatever the cost? You try getting in their way, but won't stop them. Uh, Wayne Rooney was asked recently what he thought made Sir Alex Ferguson such a successful manager. And Rooney replied, I've never seen anyone with his desire and passion. Well, have we realised Jesus had a burning passion? His overriding concern was for God, for his glory. Do you remember the clearing of the temple? Jesus couldn't have that going on in his father's house. The disciples in that passage, we are told, saw in him the zeal of Psalm 69. And when we're told here that zeal for God did in the end consume him, well, that's exactly what he did. Now, all believers know something of the experience of Psalm 69, but only Jesus has fully plumbed its depths his overriding passion for God and for God's people. It led him to shame, dishonour, lies, unjust suffering, rejection by his family, loneliness, to being offered sour wine as his enemies destroyed him on the cross. And all of this, even for the Son of God, should not surprise us. Because Psalm 69 has prepared us for it. This is what the world is like. And if we've recognised the zeal of Jesus, that will not accept anything against God's will. So the world was bound to throw everything at Jesus. Jesus was never going to flinch. Today it is right for us to want to be passionate for God. Let's not be naive what that will look like or involve. The Apostle Paul in Romans sets Jesus before us as an example. He quotes Psalm 69 and says with masterful understatement, Christ did not please himself. No, Jesus went all the way and suffered and died because of his zeal for God. So Jesus died for that reason, but there's more to Jesus' death than the wicked world getting its way. Jesus was also struck down by God. Jesus was struck down by God. Verse 26, have a look at that, tells us more about why Jesus died. For they persecute him whom you have struck down. So Jesus, in his godly zeal, was opposed and persecuted by those who hated God. But listen very carefully to that verse. There's more going on that might first meet the eye. They persecuted him whom you have struck down. So yes, they persecuted Jesus, but Jesus was struck down by God. The cross, ultimately, was God's doing. Why? What's going on? Jesus, the only one in the history of the world, did not deserve anything of Psalm 69. Quite the opposite, he was fully zealous for God in every way. Why would God strike him down? Well, the Bible has much to say on that, but for now, let's look a little closer at these verses around verse 26 in this psalm. I wonder were you listening carefully as verses 22 to 28 were read. They are very challenging verses. Did you register, for example, verse 24? 
where the psalmist prays, pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. Or even verse 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. Can such things really be said? At that dinner last week, conversation moved on, as it always does on these occasions, to the uniqueness of Jesus. Why this focus on him? Why only him? Does it really matter that much? Is it really all about him? Well, these verses here help us. Look again at the first word of verse 26. For. So, the first, verse 26, therefore, gives us the reason for the prayers in the verses around it. For they persecute him whom you have struck down. That is, verses 22 to 28 show us what rejection of Jesus deserves. I wonder, have we grasped that? God sent his one and only son into the world. And if then any oppose him, well, God is angry and rightly so. And if anyone continues in that rebellion, well, these verses describe their end, what they deserve. Look again at verse 25, which says, May their camp be a desolation, let no one dwell in their tents. You may recognize that verse. Peter quotes it to explain that that judgment was fulfilled in Judas, the one who had betrayed Jesus. Worth saying before we move on, isn't it? Hearing what life is like for a follower of Jesus in this world, as we've seen here in Psalm 69, is deeply uncomfortable. But read again verses 22 to 28. What's in store for those against Jesus is far worse. Now, these truths in verses 22 to 28 are not to be denied, but wonderfully, they are not all there is to be said about those who oppose God. They can't be because otherwise Jesus himself would never have come into the world to seek and to save those who were opposing God. Because he came to rescue. And that ultimately is what took him to what we see in verse 26. He was struck down by God. That is, Jesus experienced what the others deserve. Jesus stepped in and faced it for his people. Psalm 69 is showing us this is why he died. So Psalm 69 is one for us to meditate on, to realize ultimately it's not about what we suffer. We could only ever suffer this in a very small way compared to Jesus, it shows us the depth of what he did, what he endured for us in our place. So Psalm 69 has shown us what the world is like, shown us why Jesus had to die. And then in the light of that, as we've grasped that, it then does show us how we are to pray. So here is a prayer. We see the psalmist in great pressure prays, and he keeps praying three times, he says, answer me. When we are suffering, because we're following Jesus, we should pray, and how will we do that? Well, this psalm helps us as we follow the example of the Lord Jesus. First of all, we will pray knowing God's character. Around us today, don't we, all the time, we hear people calling out, oh my God, for the most trivial irritation dare to ask them who this God is they are referring to, they will look at you strangely and blankly. But here in verse 1, the psalmist cries out to God, and then in verse 3, he says, my God, and he means it because he knows his God. How we pray follows from what we know of God and his ways. So the world thinks suffering proves there is no God, so they don't pray. But then as believers, trials we face drive us to question what we knew or what we thought we knew about God. Answers aren't always immediately forthcoming, just like they weren't to David. And yet, look down to verse 13. 
he says, But as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord. At an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Then look down to verse 16. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. This is the language the whole Bible uses of God. The one true creator God is revealed as a God of steadfast love, of faithfulness, of mercy. And because David, the psalmist, knows that's what God is like, he prays. And we today know all the more, don't we? That is what God is like. Not least because of the fulfilment of this very psalm. Jesus, the Son of God, entered our world and endured this for us. Such love and mercy gloriously revealed. So when those tough times come, and they will, much will puzzle us, confuse us, throw us. But what remains constant is that we need never doubt God's love for us, his people, his faithfulness towards us, and that he will, in his good timing, rescue us. So we'll pray knowing God's character. We'll also pray for fellow believers. We think about ourselves, don't we, a lot. And when life is hard, we can't stop thinking about ourselves. In the midst of ridicule and opposition, all I want is a way out for me. My situation has got to improve dramatically. Yet after the opening line, asking God to save him, did we notice what was the next thing uh, the psalmist here prayed for? It comes in verse 6. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. O Lord God of hosts, let not those who seek you be brought to dishonour through me. Well, I wonder, when we're under the cosh, what a challenge. How great then is our concern for fellow believers? After all, they are watching us, whether we're aware of that or like it or not. When we are suffering, people look. How is he or she going to respond? And our response will impact those around us. If when we are under pressure we buckle, we compromise, we go quiet, just think what effect that will have on the other Christian in the office or at school or at the school date or here in our church family. Would that cause them to stumble? But if we persevere, if we stand firm, Surely others will be helped to see again the surpassing greatness of the Christ that we know. That he is far superior to the comforts, to the attractions, to the ease of this world. It would be a challenge to others and an encouragement to stand firm too. So in our suffering, cry out to God as we should. But the challenge here, let's pray too for those around us. Those who see what we're going through for their relationship with Christ. Pray for ourselves that as we face this trial, others won't be put to shame through us. Think of Jesus, again dreading what was coming his way. But do you remember what he did on the night before his death? As the opponents were closing in, Jesus prayed for his disciples and not only for them. He prayed like this, he says... I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Can you believe it? At that moment, Jesus prayed for us. And if you look at the prayer, he didn't pray that we'd be taken out of this world just yet. He prayed that we'd be kept safe from the evil one and not be put to shame. So we'll pray, knowing God's character, we'll pray for fellow believers. And finally, we will pray with praise and confidence. Uh, There's no sign in this psalm that the suffering has yet abated. But still, look down to the resolve of the psalmist down in verse 30. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. How is this possible? How is it that David will praise God even with thanksgiving? He tells us, verse 33, 
For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. You see, despite appearances, how it looks to the world, even to ourselves, David knows God does love him and in his good time will answer this prayer and act. And it won't just be the psalmist, David, praising God. Look at verse 34. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. All will praise God because, reading on, for God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it and those who love his name shall dwell in it. A new world is coming where injustice and pain and shame and dishonour will be no more. That'll be because those who continue in rebellion against God will, as the psalmist prayed, be judged. They won't be there to spoil it. But God's people, those who love his name, will be there with suffering over. Listen again to what Jesus prayed in that prayer the night before his death for us, he says. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me. So today, as we pray, we may well not understand what is happening now. But because of Jesus, his death and resurrection, we do know what the future holds. And so now we can praise God with confidence. Much to ponder from Psalm 69, much to pray through. We've been reminded what our world is like. We've seen the one who endured the world's opposition to the uttermost as he was struck down by God for us. And we've been spurred on to pray, particularly in the hard times, to the God we now know loves us. Let's close in a prayer. Our Father, we praise you, therefore, for your steadfast love, your saving faithfulness, your abundant mercy. We praise you for all that we see in the Lord Jesus, who came in fulfilment of this psalm to endure both a world's scorn and your judgment for us. We praise you that because of what he did, whatever life is like now for us, our future with you is assured. And so as we await that day, would we remain faithful to you, zealous for you, like Christ, in the midst of a hostile world? And we too pray that no others will be brought to shame through us, for Jesus' sake. Amen.